Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails Common Ground. I'm Malva Kajali, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Field Notes editor here at the Brooklyn Rail, Paul Maddock, and special guest, author Jason E. Smith, in celebration of his upcoming monograph, Smart Machines and Service Work, Automation in an Age of Stagnation, which uh, will be available in just a few short weeks uh, from Reaction Books, so looking forward. Um, the text explores, my understanding is many topics relevant to many of our lives, uh, productivity, labor, and how we are living in ostensibly an age of tech. Uh, so very excited for that. We're also so lucky to have the poet Brendan Joyce with us today, who will read to close today's program. To begin, I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsi, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation, the traditional owners, of the unceded land and waters on which we stand. The Brooklyn Rail would also like to honor the lives of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Nina Pop, David McAtee, James Scurlock, Jamal Floyd, Ameth Arbery, Richard Brooks, Rhea Milton, Dominique Remy Fells, Toyin Solau, Walter Wallace Jr., and countless others we've lost to white supremacy and police violence in this country. And we would also like to acknowledge that justice will come from the streets from the nation demanding accountability and refusing to move on until Black Lives Matter in the eyes of the state. Before I introduce our illustrious guests, we invite you to join us for a brief moment of silence. Thank you. And now to introduce our special guests. Paul Maddock is the Rails Field Notes editor, as I mentioned. His most recent books are Theory is Critique, Essays on Capital, which came out just last year with Haymarket, uh, and Business as Usual, The Economic Crisis and the Failure of Capitalism, also through Reaction Books in 2011. He will be joined by Jason E. Smith, who writes about contemporary art, philosophy, and politics, among many other things. His work has appeared in Art Forum, Grave Room, October, and SAQ among other places, and he frequently writes for the Brooklyn Rails Field Notes section, of which Paul is captain. He's currently finishing two books, one that he has finished on automation and the other on the theory of the party in political struggles. And he's currently chair of the Graduate Art Department at Art Center College of Design. Uh, without further ado, handing the microphone over to you. Oh, one moment. Paul, will you unmute? I'm unmuted. Perfect. Which gives me a chance to say thank you, Melvin. Thank you very much for that elegant and well done introduction. And um, I'm really, really happy that Jason could join us. This is the, he is the author of the fourth Field Notes book. And uh, it's a really good one. I'm very happy that we were able to uh, get him to write it and to give it to us. So. Uh, I think it'll probably garner a lot of attention. And um, part of my fiendish plan is to start giving it attention today, because I think, as Malvika said, it, it concerns matters which are really of interest and involve everybody who is listening and also many people who are not listening to this podcast. So, Jason, hi. Hey, how are you? I, I should say really quickly, Paul, just uh, as a preliminary um, Note, I, I just really wanted to thank uh, the Brooklyn Rail, not only for hosting this, um, but also for hosting my, my, my writing over the last, I don't know, it's probably been four or five years now. It's been a really important part of, of, um, of my writing life uh, over the past, whatever, a few years. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, before we start. So. Well, the, the, the acknowledgement is mutual. So <laughs> the thing about the Brooklyn Rail is that it is its writers. And it's, of course, it's designers and illustrators as well. So you're an important part of it. And thanks for all of that and for being here. I, I want to start by saying that it's, it's, uh, it's actually very nice timing to have you on, have you uh, doing this today, because just a couple of days ago, MIT came out with it, the results of its three year study on robotics and the social impact of robotics. They were, um, for some reason, the president of MIT took it into his head to be worried about the same topics you're worried. He, con right. he convened a very large panel of experts in artificial intelligence, robotics, society, sociology, political science, and they labored for three years. 
And they came up with a rather unsophisticated and theoretically less interesting version of exactly what you said. So in my opinion, they would have done well to save themselves all the effort and just read, wait for your book and read it when it came out. But it brings up the quest, my first question, which is um, something you point out in the introduction of the book that the, the, the issue of society being taken over by robots, the issue of, of sort of a kind of a runaway sorcerer's apprentice of automation and its effects on society, whether good, everybody's gonna live in a leisurely life with abundant goods produced for us by machines or bad, we're going to have mass unemployment and terrible suffering, um, that this theme arises periodically every 10 or 15 years and for, uh, since the Second World War. And I wondered if you'd start by saying something about why do you think this is a sort of periodic problem that people concerned with society feel the need to investigate and pontificate on? And why do you think right at this particular moment, this has emerged again as a concern? Good questions, good questions. I'm not sure I have uh, the exact answer to the first, um, first part of the question. I mean, it's certainly a kind of cyclical pattern that we see. And um, particularly in the US uh, and probably in the, you know, the kind of advanced con economies of, of Western Europe as well, uh, it's really the post-war period where you, see, where you see the first kind of very, very uh, sort of massive wave of discussion of the ongoing or imminent automation of, if not the economy as a whole, certain sectors of the economy, particularly um, heavy industry, steel and, and oil production and, or oil refining and that sort of thing. And um, I think that in some sense, there was a kind of uh, really, really important and pronounced moment of technological change in the post-war period. It's one that sort of stems from uh, really the 30s, maybe, maybe even the 20s, if you start thinking about internal combustion engines and uh, the kind of infrastructure that had to be produced to sort of, um, to sort of allow for, for example, the, the role the automobile came to have in American life and, and to some extent in Western European life as well. Um, but what, re, what you also had with these kind of um, really, really important technological breakthroughs in the 30s, as early as the 30s, and certainly during the war, with cybernetics, with so-called servo mechanisms, uh, with um, uh, sort of feedback sort of phenomena and that sort of thing. And so a lot of those um, elements were uh, introduced as early as the 30s in certain industries, but certainly in the post-war period where the kind of signature American industries like steel and automobiles underwent these rapid sort of automation um, sort of uh, processes. And so there was really a, a kind of um, real and significant historical transformation that took place in that period. Now, I think there's a, there's a, there's a way in which for various reasons, we see every 10 years, every 20 years, every 30 years, a kind of return to the theme of automation. Um, so for example, in the early 90s, there was a really, there was a kind of, uh, a, a, maybe a slightly less pronounced, but nevertheless, um, very similar uh, rhetoric of automation or mechanization of the service sector um, that you could see in the pages of the Wall Street Journal and the popular press uh, in general. Lots of books, Jeremy Rifkin wrote a famous book uh, uh, on the end of work that was published in 93, 94. And it was, you know, it was right before a, a little bit of a surge um, in a kind of, uh, in some of the, um, both in mechanization of certain sectors, uh, but also in, in some of the larger macroeconomic registers. Um, but one of the points I make in the book is there's this kind of really, really profound shift that occurs in the advanced so-called industrial economies in the early 70s or mid 70s. And that in a certain sense, what we see since the early 70s is a repetition of this rhetoric of imminent automation um, that's taking place over this kind of abyss of economic stagnation, a kind of prolonged economic stagnation, not only over the last decade, which is sort of the starting point for my book uh, in some sense, but really for the last 40, 50 years. And so the question is why, why do we see this? And again, I think there's a, there are some cyclical dynamics involved in terms of um, thinking about why you see this recurrence. But I think within the last, really last, 10 years, um, maybe even five years in particular, there's been this kind of real uh, drumbeat of uh, discussions of, of automation, both in, in, to some extent, the academy, um, certainly in business schools, and, um, and definitely in the popular press. I mean, the New York Times, every single day, there's an article about automation. 
um, think tanks, you know, commission studies like the one you, you described. Um, and um, what's interesting there is I think that something strange is going on. On the one hand, you have this rhetoric of technological change, which um, for the automation theorists means, number one, the replacement of a large, you know, a, maybe even half of the entire uh, labor market by mechanization or automation. Um, number two, an explosion in labor productivity. And number three, mass unemployment. Um, but none of the indicators that we, we see that the, you know, the Bureau of Labor Statistics or other agencies report uh, give any indication that these things are happening. To the contrary, what we've seen is uh, almost zero labor, labor productivity growth over the course of the last decade, a decade of crisis, even in manufacturing, I should point out, not just in the so-called service sector. And um, you also see uh, the, um, oh, very importantly, a kind of collapse of business investment. It's a, it's a trend that's really starting maybe, you know, as early as the 70s, but certainly accelerates around 2000, around the turn of the century. So all the macroeconomic indicators indicate that there's nothing like a technological change of the sort that's being promoted or discussed widely um, in the popular press. And I just to, to end on this note, I, I know I'm going on quite a bit, but I'll just say that I think that, um, or I hypothesize that on some level, certainly the role of tech companies in the stock markets, stock markets which have been, which have been essentially just goosed by massive tsunamis of, of cheap money, uh, that have, and quantitative easing, of course, which has sort of forced people to to dump money into the stock market. But also, I think that the, just the 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 everyday impact of social media and, and smartphones and that sort of thing on people's lot on their on their everyday life has also given one has has provided or has generated a kind of environment in which the this kind of rhetoric can take hold despite all the indicators to the contrary that we're not in a, a, an age of technological change to the, to the to the contrary it's one of prolonged crisis and deep crisis so um, I was curious about your, I noticed the phrase so-called services and right. the suggestion that the decline in productivity and the sort of failure of the tech, the big tech idea to actually be a real determining presence in the economy uh, is related to the idea that so much of the economy is now a service economy. So this is a confusing term. What, what are services and what's the problem? Well, that's a good point. There's a couple of ways to think about this, I think. And I talk about this, of course, in the book at, at some length. I mean, on the one hand, service is a, is a kind of, you know, it's an old term. Um, you can find it in classical political, political economists. And certainly since the middle of the 20th century, you, you find it used all the time. And one speaks often, sociologists, you know, uh, speak often of, of service economies, uh, even deindustrialization, things like that. And of course, service economy, or the notion of a service is a kind of useful one in some sense. Um, it describes and, and lumps together, uh, for better or for worse, all those kinds of laboring activities, which in some sense don't produce a, a, a discrete or kind of separable object that somehow can be sold on the market at a time after its production. Um, and I guess, you know, it, it is the case that a lot of the laboring activity that people are compelled to perform are those types of activities. Um, it also suggests um, or allows us to think a little bit about, because of the nature of the, the concrete labor process itself, allows us to think about why it is that so many jobs, despite the rhetoric of imminent automation, um, are so difficult to mechanize. There's, there's something about the labor process itself when you're talking about being a nurse's aide or being a teacher or um, working in retail or in restaurants. There's something about the, the labor process itself which makes those jobs difficult to automate because they require uh, types of knowledge, if you like, that can't be programmed um, in a way that certain kinds of, let's say, industrial activities in, in a kind of factory environment might. That being said, of course, the problem with the service sector is it, right now in the, in the US, I think you're talking 82% or something like that um, of the job. So at a certain point, just analytically, it's unclear what we're talking about when four-fifths of the jobs are considered service sector. But number two, it actually misses, and I think everyone probably would agree with this, uh, it really misses the kind of crucial distinctions between uh, not only skill levels, wage levels, uh, that sort of thing, um, but also between activities performed in the private sector versus those performed in the government, uh, government sector, public sector. Huge amount of uh, you know, the activities in the, in the 
public sector are services that are provided, uh, oftentimes not on the market, but, but uh, provisioned uh, by, directly um, by the government. Um, but above all, I think there's this question of, of the, 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 the category of services is really a symptomatic kind of erasure or distortion of a more fundamental question which is that of productivity and what productivity means. Now, on the one hand, one of the reasons why, or one of the, the most co coherent and convincing arguments that sociologists and economists make for why there's been ongoing declines in labor productivity gains is that more and more labor is being allocated to the service sector. That is to say, to low productivity, kind of uh, labor intensive uh, work. And to some extent that makes sense as more and more people are being, more and more labor is reallocated there. The overall aggregate labor productivity gains are gonna be less and less. In fact, in a kind of asymptomatic way, they'll verge towards zero. But of course the problem with, with the service sector ultimately is it, dis, it does not distinguish between jobs that, or activities that in, in Marx's, and even also in Smith's uh, you know, sort of conceptual framework, uh, those jobs that produce value, that is to say they're actually productive of value and those jobs that are in some sense unproductive. And what's really important I think um, in considering this or that uh, form of labor or this or that labor process or the, this or that industry for that matter is to consider where they sit on a kind of value circuit uh, rather, than, rather than considering them only in terms of the kind of concrete labor process which you can empirically verify. That's to say, you can see that this kind of job produces some kind of immaterial uh, commodity um, or whatever service. This one produces a kind of discrete object, something like that. That's a really, really, I mean, it's amazing how prevalent that kind of way of looking at uh, the economy and labor processes is. Uh, and yet, I, probably because it's just so obviously intuitive in some way, but it, it, in some sense, it really, really obscures the fundamental questions that are at stake in looking at why we live in an economy in which um, there's been not only technological stagnation, but also wage stagnation. So I don't know if that gets to, gets yeah. to your point. I mean, I know that you have- Well, um, it's, it's getting, okay. it's getting okay. there. So maybe in a way of taking it a little farther would be to, I guess, um, if, if the point of the, of, the, of the capitalist economy is to produce value and more and more of the labor which is employed is not, according to you, doing that, how does that situation come about? In other words, why, how did it, how, how did it come about and why is it the case that the vast majority of work that people do seems to be this, in this strange service category um, which, uh, of which at least a large portion seems not to actually contribute to the production of value and therefore of profits for um, the economic system. So why would that be? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a, that's a little bit harder, harder <laughs> question. I mean, there's a couple of things to, I'll just point out. I mean, what, and I, I think of the interview that I, that I just um, did with Tony Smith, um, the great Tony Smith, um, that was just published <laughs> in Brooklyn Real. I sort of touch on, on this question a bit. I mean, I do think that, um, I mean, let's, let, I'll take a step back. I mean, why is it that um, the distinction between productive and unproductive labor is so important? Um, uh, despite the fact that in some sense, they're, they're very, there's a level of abstraction implied in those concepts that, um, uh, that makes them hard to sort of apply empirically. For example, it's very hard to, to look at a specific job or a specific sector and say, oh, that, that's unproductive labor and that's productive labor, right? It's a, it's a, there's a, again, Marx's uh, conceptual framework op operates at a level of abstraction that doesn't allow often that kind of one-to-one um, kind of -one sort of uh, relationship between the, the analytical category and this or that empirical phenomenon. Um, but yeah, the question, I mean, first of all, it, it's clear that um, they're in, particularly in the 1950s, um, there was uh, a kind of rapid um, and profound transformation of certain sectors of the economy. And of course, the question is what happens to that labor when, for example, labor productivity gains have made it such that one can produce the same amount of output with less, you know, with less units of labor. Um, and of course, there's a couple of things to think about there. On the one hand, um, 
that didn't produce mass unemployment, right? I mean, what, what's interesting about a lot of the rhetoric of, of automation in the current moment is that it's always tied to mass unemployment, the, this, this fear of mass unemployment. But the fact of the matter is that in economic booms of that sort, uh, you don't see mass unemployment. In fact, you see, you see long-term transformations of the labor market, well, short-term transformations of the labor market, and also long-term, let's say, uh, accumulation of a kind of reserve army that might be, uh, have a more um, precarious relationship to employment, but that's not. But but whenever you see mass unemployment, you see it during economic crises. You see it in 2008. You see it in 1933, and so on and so forth. Now the question is, why has so much? Um, why is there? Let's say to put this in slightly um, awkward terms, why do we see a rising ratio of unproductive to productive labor in the economy? Um, it's a very, very good question. I'll, I'll defer, I mean, in some sense, uh, I think Fred Mosley's work is very, very good here and very important and certainly influential on my perspective. I will say that there is a tendency uh, for labor to be as, as certain sectors, particularly value productive sectors are automated or mechanized to reallocate labor towards other sectors, right? And that could be uh, ancillary or um, adjacent uh, sectors that provide support, if you like, for that that industrial core, that kind of value producing core. And it's also the case that in many cases, uh, those, um, the labor processes required of those types of, or the labor processes that um, emerge in these kind of new industries, uh, for example, or massive expansion, for example, of transportation or circulation industries, um, do in fact require or resist in some sense, some of the uh, technological substitution or replacement or mechanization that are more easily um, implemented in you know, production of steel mm -hmm. and manufacturing. But, so, but, so, but I think there is a long-term, let's say, um, I don't know. I don't know if law is the right term. I think law might be the right term. I mean, certainly Marx would use that term. And there is a kind of tendency within the kind of development of the capitalist mode of production for more and more labor to be allocated towards uh, unproductive activities. Now, the question is, why can't those activities also be automated uh, at the same rate mm -hmm. as those in the productive value producing segments of, of the of the value circuit or the sectors of the economy? That's a very, very difficult question. I talk about this at some length in the book about why it is that that's the case. Um, but it's a it's a um, it's a thorny uh, problem to address. You just you just spoke about the allocation of labor to your phrase is other sectors yeah. as a the labor which is sort of freed up by the mechanization of industrial processes, for example. Yeah, sure. Um, in your book, you use a, a less uh, neutral sounding term in a chapter in which you, which you call the servant economy. Right, that's right. It's one of the most striking um, phenomena that, that you discuss in the book is the transformation is, that what has been produced is not so much mass unemployment per se, although that periodically erupts like at the present time, or as you say, in periods of acute crisis, but the transformation of, you know, the, the, the production of what are called in the popular press bad jobs, yeah. which itself is a euphemism, and which you put it much more crudely and directly by calling them essentially industrially organized servants. Right. So, what, what do you mean in talking about the, the advent of a servant economy? How did that come about? And why would that be the particular outcome of this process in the, say, since the 1970s? Well, I think this is, this is a really in, important point in the, in the book. And I, I would sort of start out by saying, and this is something that everyone seems to acknowledge, maybe except for some people in business schools, um, is that all the job growth that you've seen in the US uh, since really, well, certainly since 2008, but really since the turn of the century, have been in almost entirely low wage, uh, so-called low skill service sector jobs, okay? And that's, that's really, really important because that's the only, I mean, you're literally talking about um, three quarters of the economy in terms of job growth are in those sectors, right? Or in those, in those types of occupations. So what and, are those um, occupations? What's that? Can you, can you say more specifically, what are those occupations? Yeah, well, things like, for example, well, certainly in, in restaurants, uh, particularly fast food restaurants is mm -hmm. one, uh, is one, uh, one area. Uh, teachers' aides, nurses' aides, people working in healthcare primarily, uh, home health care. I mean, I, I, exactly, is it called home health aid? Something home, like that, I forget the yeah. job category. But people essentially who are, 
not working in hospitals or doctor's offices, but going usually oftentimes in, in kind of um, uh, in people's homes, right? And caring mm -hmm. for elderly people or people who were not able to perform whatever tasks they, they need to. Um, and that's a very, very, I mean, it's important for a lot of reasons, this idea. I mean, first of all, it does, th there's this kind of gravitation of those jobs, particularly in the, the example just given of people not working in workplaces with other workers, for example, with whom they can form bonds of solidarity or, or perhaps uh, sort of resist in some way the kinds of disciplines that are imposed by their by their bosses, but people who are, are essentially, you know, sort of uh, stuck in other people's houses, performing essentially uh, various kinds of personal services, including bathing, cooking, so on and so forth. Um, I think it's complicated. The term servant is a little bit complicated. I mean, on the one hand, um, I did want to evoke this idea that more and more of job growth in the service sector is in personal services. And that could mean anything from, you know, sort of massages, uh, haircuts, uh, you know, home health care type uh, aids. And that's not meant to diminish or in somehow denigrate those jobs. In fact, I would say many of the jobs that are being, uh, that are available, newly available in the job market, which are considered low skill jobs, in fact, require incredibly complex uh, skills that are usually involve um, a kind of uh, complex human intuitive dynamic. And there's skills that are oftentimes learned uh, over the course of a lifetime, uh, how to care for children, how to care for uh, other people. Um, but they're skills because you don't go to college or you don't go to, um, you know, Swarthmore to, uh, to get, you know, accredited for those things. They are deemed not, they're not skilled or the low skilled activities. Now, so in a certain sense, that's the idea is that in, there's, this, there's this kind of tendential um, pattern within current trends in the job market towards the reallocation of labor, not simply to the service sector, but to the personal services. Now, and the term servant, I, I, I should say, you know, I, I, um, I was, in, I should say also, I mean, the term probably resonates with people who are writing about the gig economy, for example, uh, people, I mean, in the context of this pandemic, people who were able to have their, uh, their groceries delivered by other people uh, probably feel like that term, whether they want to uh, address it or not, that term probably is relevant to the kinds of mm -hmm. activities being performed there. Um, now, the, the important point I want to make is that I, I take the term uh, uh, explicitly from Marx and the volume one of Capital. And Marx makes this kind of this point about um, about trends in class composition as advanced economies industrialize. And what he says is that, you know, and, and this is really, really poignant for thinking about how this all relates to class struggle and the labor movement and that sort of thing is he says, well, you know, even in 1867 or, or whenever he's publishing uh, the first volume of Capital or the third volume, I don't know exactly, excuse me, the third edition <laughs> of the first volume, he says something like, well, you know, despite the fact that our fantasies of industrialization imply this, this tendency towards incorporating more and more of the working population into, let's say, industry or heavy industry, mining or steel or textiles, what you in fact see is a massive expansion of the so-called servant class. So, so the tendency is not towards everyone becoming a factory worker. The tendency is just the opposite. It's toward a smaller and smaller, I mean, there's an expansion of course of the industrial core of the economy uh, over the course of the 19th and 20th century. But, but even in 1867, he says there's, there's more so-called servants uh, employed in households across Britain today than there are any in the, in the mines and in, in all the industries. And, um, and I think that's very, very important to think about because I think that there's an assumption particularly coming from the the socialist movement um, in its kind of broad sort of quasi Marxist um, orientation, which imagines that Marx's vision of history and particularly the development of the capitalist mode of production was one in which uh, everyone would be a factory worker. We would all be making tanks in, uh, in Moscow in some, <laughs> some factory in the outskirts of Moscow. And that's not the case at all. And so I wanted to sort of make that point across those different registers. Uh, that sense that the personal services, um, this idea that more and more activities that people are forced to, to uh, do for wages um, have this kind of direct sort of relationship between 
the person performing it and, and the consumer, but also um, to sort of resonate with, with Marx's own account. And I, I could say more about that, but I, maybe I've gone on a bit. Well, I think that's actually extremely interesting. And it's particularly interesting to trace it back even directly to Marx, because as you say, traditionally in Marxism as a historical, his historical doctrine and set of movements, the picture has always been one of the factory worker and specifically the male factory yeah, worker sure. as the central figure of the Marxist work, the Marxist agent of social change. Uh, and so it's actually very interesting to think that not only did Marx already figure it out, but, but in fact, that's not what happened. Right. The, uh, actually, the male factory worker is a very small minority now of the working class. Uh, and in fact, meant much of the kinds of work that you are describing as the growing and dominant uh, kinds of labor which are becoming available have historically been defined as women's work and involving right. caretaking and uh, taking care of children or of sick people or family or cooking all. So it, what's, what's interesting is that that traditional way of thinking about a worker's movement in terms of the regiment of horny handed sons of toil in, in, in the factory organized wearing their hard hats and coming out on strike no longer if it ever did but certainly not today and not in the future, in the near future, fits the reality of who actually works for a living. And I wondered if you might want to say something about the consequences to be drawn from that of, for the traditional ideas of what a worker's movement would be like. Because obviously, you know, if, if we have, a, if 12% if of the population is working in factories, then any, social movement uh, to change capitalism in the future is not going to consist of factory workers. Right. But if it's going to be a movement of, that you could describe as a movement of a working class, it will have a completely different complexion, a completely different set of gender characteristics, a different set of work experiences and different modes of organization and relationship to each other, of individuals to each other. So maybe you would say something about that. Yeah, I think that's really important. And I think in some sense, uh, I think, you know, I, I talk about, about possibilities uh, for emerging uh, tendencies within, so the, you know, class struggle, if you want to put it in those terms. Um, it, towards the end of the book, I think in some sense, I wrote the book because I wanted to understand what was going on in, in, the, in the world around me, of course, but I also, I think the horizon was always that sense that that's the question we have to, to look at is what does class struggle look like after the labor movement in the, in the terms that we have come to sort of understand that. And it is, as you say, I mean, it's, it's the labor movement really of the late 18, late 1900s up to 1970, let's say. 18, what's 1870 to 1970, 1875, 1975, because of course the labor movement in the early uh, period, the labor movement, or let's say let's, the composition of the working class and the early phases of English industrialization had lots and lots of women uh, that were mm -hmm. sort of drawn in from the countryside along with men. And, and of course, if you read those, those the, the famous chapter uh, 15, uh, Marx dwells a great deal on that. In fact, he's writing right at that cusp in some sense of this kind of transformation and really consolidation of the workers movement around a, a kind of male figure, kind of male uh, industrial figure of the worker. So, so I think that on some level, the, the riddle that I want to, to not solve, of course, but to sort of think through a little bit is what form of um, what forms of struggle would be possible in a context where class composition has been transformed so radically since certainly the, the post-war period um, in the US. And I think that that's a lot, so to some extent my, you know, the balance sheet is quite negative in fact. Um, and, it, and to some extent that's something that I think everyone on the left um, quote unquote sort of also acknowledges is that certainly since the seventies um, there's been a kind of uh, defeat of the labor movement and of the working class more generally. And there's lots of explanations usually having to do with Reagan and a dismantling of unions and so on and so forth. I didn't think that was a, a strong enough account 
um, or, or a convincing enough account. I mean, uh, the union participation rate or however you describe that uh, has gone down considerably since 1980. I think it's probably uh, from 20 to 10%, something like that. Um, wasn't that high in the in the, the peak was about thirty five percent. Right, exactly. That and of course, those, yeah. those were oftentimes in, in key industries. You know, in terms of their their place within the total social articulation. Uh, so qualitatively, even though the, those numbers are not a ma majority, they were important industries that could really act within which actions could really uh, do damage. Uh, you know, economically to the capitalist class. Um, but one of the things that I really sort of try to put a lot of pressure on in the book is, is the link between wage stagnation and um, declining labor productivity gains. Because that is a really, really important key to the whole picture, I think. And it's one that doesn't get, I think it's misunderstood actually quite a bit, and even amongst people who are very, very smart. Um, but the consol or the kind of um, expansion or um, consolidation of the power of the labor movement in the US in the post-war period in particular was entire, but also, also elsewhere in, in, in Western Europe was entirely tied to labor productivity gains in the key sectors in, in steel, automation and so on and so forth. And you see actually at the oftentimes at the national level um, and certainly in places like Italy and France where, where there's a different kind of relationship between the state capital and labor, you see these um, you see, again, at the sector level, certainly, um, you see wage gains tied explicitly to productivity gains, oftentimes directly correlated in labor contracts, you know, that the unions and the, and the, and the bosses uh, work out through whatever kind of process. And the idea is quite simple, that if there are labor productivity gains, those gains can be shared equally, quote unquote, that is say at the same rate of, or the same shares of income that capital and labor, that prevail you know, between capital and labor. Um, so that their labor productivity gains, those gains can be shared between capital and labor, probably not symmetrically, but that does make possible something like wage gains, right? So it, it has to be reflected in these productivity gains. And if there aren't productivity gains, then the only way there can be wage gains is by a direct diminution of the return on capital, let's say the income that, that accrues to capital, right? And so that's that's not going to happen uh, under almost any prevailing scenario, that capital will not simply cede some share of its income uh, without those corresponding productivity gains, right? And so that's, 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 in fact, that's in some sense what we've seen since the mid seventies is this kind of dogged attempt by capital in a context in which uh, productivity uh, gains and GDP growth more generally have sort of um, tapered off, you see this kind of dogged refusal to uh, not only allow for, of course, a larger, larger share of um, labor share of income, but even to kind of clawing tooth and nail back uh, any possible productivity gains that do emerge. Uh, and the result is actually um, wage stagnation. So that's the, the first thing. I'm, I'm not putting that as, as well as I'd like to, but the point being, I'll insist, is that the vibrant and robust post-war labor movement the US, uh, uh, labor movement in the US depended on labor productivity gains for any gains that it might have made in its you know sort of uh, struggle with capital. Uh, the second one I want to point out, and this is something that I, that's a little bit more um, intuitive on some level, but I will say this. So basically the idea behind industrialization, if you want to use that term, maybe it's not a very good term, is that as technologies, as kind of core technologies, um, are implemented in industry uh, and are generalized across the economy or across the, you know, particular sectors like steel and automobiles, that sort of thing. What ends up happening is that the labor processes within these distinct craft traditions actually become increasingly similar to one another. So there's a kind of homogenization of labor process across industries which are otherwise separate historically. So people in, in steel and people in automobile factories are performing very, very similar tasks using very, very similar machines. And so that, so, so that kind of labor process homogenization or generalization is I think a key aspect of the ability to organize the labor movement across individual sectors or individual crafts as was the case in the late 19th century. So that kind of homogenization of the labor process across industries is really, really important. So when you have a, a, a period like our own where all the labor 
all the uh, job growth is in, um, in oftentimes uh, labor intensive uh, small workplaces with not many workers, that sort of thing, that are oftentimes dispersed in space. I mean, literally in some cases, people are going to buy themselves to other people's homes uh, to perform labor mm -hmm. um, or perform jobs. What you have there is a kind of, what's the word? A kind of um, disintegration or decomposition of some of the material conditions for a kind of robust solidarity, uh, working class solidarity across industries. And so that's a real, that kind of, I don't know if atomization is the right word, but that kind of pulverization is really, really important part of the process since the 1970s. You'll have to excuse me, I, there's a leaf blower uh, outside, so. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's been sort of interesting. I, I noticed that a lot of the labor actions in the last few years have been taking place in what you would classify as the service sector. For the most, the biggest, probably the most interesting case is the teachers yeah, in West sure. Virginia and other states. Love. And the other cases that I can think of, particularly in, in response to the COVID yeah. problem, right? Um, you had you had a lot of you had a lot of strikes in, among truck drivers, bus drivers. Uh, there was just a strike yesterday, a wildcat strike by um, teamsters in oh. in the Midwest who were complaining about the lack of, of Healthcare equipment and so forth, and against the, their union, against the union's will, and which is now kind of a big struggle. But you know, there's 400 people, but they're they're they. Uh, it seems to me that these are all workers who are not completely isolated, even though they don't work in factories. Yeah, UP workers work out of a particular location, and they're also connected to each other partly through a union organization. The teachers are all they're they're not working on the same school, but they're all working for the same. Yeah state school department and so forth. So it's what it's, I guess what's interesting is to speculate or maybe to draw from such experiences, what might be emerging new patterns of um, working class organization that are adapted particularly to this condition of being in the service economy. I know there have even been organizations constructed in among people who are probably in a very weak position economically and socially like McDonald's workers, yeah. but they are able to sort of organize strikes and walkouts and protests. So um, I, I guess I'm interested, in, I, 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 if you have any thoughts, I would be interested to explore a little bit, you know, how different is it really? Because, you know, even in, even in the past, for example, certain industries like textile in the United States, which is very, very large, was probably the second largest industry, if not the largest industry in, in the South. You said, they, yeah, they, I was going to say the South in particular, the right? South were, they could not be organized, partly because the unions didn't make the effort, uh, partly because they were never willing to confront the race question directly. Um, but um, it's also very hard because textile, uh, the textile industry is organized was probably, in, in, but it's even today in, in a place like Bangladesh, for example, or in Indonesia, organized in small shops, small factories, not very, you know, it's not like an automobile factory that 40,000 people work in. It's probably right. a little factory that 200 people work in. Exactly, yeah. Uh, and so it's very, very difficult to organize those things. But that was also true for industrial labor, not just right. for service labor. So I guess I'm, Maybe it's my eternal optimism, but I even want to question how. how I, obviously, we're in a different world, but you know what? What? What is? What is the fine? You know, if you if you draw a fine tooth comb through through social reality, what differences are important, and what continuities and similarities are still there? And I wondered if you had any thoughts about that from having investigated these questions. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, uh, I mean, I, I guess we could step back and say, well, what have we seen, you know, I, I, on some level over the past eight months, but then over the past five years. And I've actually been struck by the fact that people who have been really, really uh, thrown into a kind of very, very difficult situation, uh, particularly people working in hospitals, nurses, and that sort of thing. I'm, I'm surprised there haven't been more 
uh, interruptions uh, mm -hmm. in, in those places in particular. I think there's obviously a complex ethical tension there between refusing uh, to or withdrawing one's labor and then having people suffering or otherwise um, depending on you to survive. And I think that's a that's a very important mm -hmm. uh, and complex aspect of the current situation. Uh, of course, there were these these kind of extraordinary, um, really revolts uh, in the late May and early June, um, which weren't necessarily tied to workplaces, but were uh, anti-state revolts or anti-police, to, to think of the police as in some sense, the kind of uh, the most um, outward facing, but also kind of exemplary figure of the state for us in the current period. Um, the Fed and the police are the two, in some sense, the figures of the state for, for us today, I think. Um, but if you look over the, the, the past five, five uh, years or so, you're right. I mean, there's the, on the one hand, in, particularly in the US, there's the teacher strikes, uh, have been, which have been really, really remarkable, ha oftentimes happening in so-called conservative states or people who otherwise, states that otherwise vote for, uh, re you know, Republicans or what, whatever. Um, and then you have, you know, outside of the US, you have the Gilets Jaunes movement in France, which for me is really, really an important um, uh, phenomenon, which in some sense, I, I always thought of as being an incredibly American type. <laughs> like it's a type of type of uh, struggle that I would imagine the form it took seems very, very American to me and not French, you know, because Could you my, say what you mean by that? Well, I mean, in the sense that, that you know, French, you know, struggles, which are very, very cyclical in some sense, uh, they're very predictable almost. And they oftentimes are led by the CGT, you know, the kind of big sort of formerly communist uh, aligned uh, um, labor union. Um, and they're oftentimes, which, which is, in, you know, it's a very small part of the working population in France, but it's actually uh, embedded within really, really key industries like the nuclear industry, which in France is of course 70% mm -hmm. of the uh, energy production. Um, but also there's a CGT police, for example. Um, so, but, but real, you know, people who work in the, uh, the, the um, public services like railways and that sort of thing. But basically my image of, of the French, uh, you know, French struggles over the past, um, whatever, let's say since 68, are large scale union mobilizations combined with sort of autonomous groups that you can think of as being somehow anarchist maybe and, or, or insurrectionary in some, some sense of the term that are in some sense involved in those movements but also kind of in some sense working against or on the outside of whatever the official consecrated labor movements um, version of the struggle may be and that it organize it has vast capacity to organize these massive massive demonstrations which don't don't do anything but the, but the 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 gilet jaune was which much different it was entirely unorganized uh except through some social media things and that sort of thing and it's people oftentimes who've never been involved in any kind of struggle in their workplace or or, or otherwise um it tended to be a worker struggle which took place outside of work let's say outside of the workplace and of course it took place, I mean, and the people involved were, were neither the kind of unionized core of the classic French sort of labor movement, nor the kind of autonomous insurrectionary uh, wing of the movement, which oftentimes, again, is opposed to the, to, the, to the labor movement, but at the same time, always working kind of in relationship to it. Um, it's a totally different group, a totally different sociological stratum. And the forms, because they weren't able to get, I mean, first of all, they're living, in I think what we call the exurban, I don't know if that's, is that, if that's the right term, mm -hmm. the exurban kind of band around large cities usually. I think Phil Neal has called it the near hinterland, which is a much, <laughs> more, beautiful, uh, yes. much more beautiful <laughs> formulation that really hits the point. It's like both very near, but also very distant in some other uh, more profound sense of, the, sense of distance. Um, but it's really a revolt of those people who don't belong to the kind of classical grid of, of um, mobilization of kind of political and social mobilization. And of course, because they couldn't strike at work, um, they had to do all these weird things where they went to like roundabouts uh, and sort of occupied roundabouts, um, something I guess we don't really have in the States, but, but in, in France, of course, they're everywhere. And of course, they also went to city centers like the Champs-Élysées and kind of totally smashed up everything, you know? <laughs> so it's this kind of interesting sort of dimension where they're more insurrectionary than the insurrectionaries uh, in the sense that they totally laid waste to the most important, you know, avenue in, in, uh, in the um, Parisian, you know, sort of uh, utopia. 
Uh, on the other hand, um, they're also kind of the most desperate in some sense, um, but there's this constant tension. So in any case, that's a very, to me, that, that's the kind of struggle that I would imagine could happen in the US. It didn't happen there in the near, the near hinterland. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, uh, just to come back to the teacher question, I mean, the teacher, I mean, of course, they're still, they're, it's in the public sector. They're oftentimes, uh, I mean, certainly in LA, the union is very, very powerful and able to exert its will uh, um, in ways that uh, other kinds of workers aren't able to do for some of the reasons you point out. I mean, they don't work, they work in individual schools, but it's an entire school district, the LAUSD. It's like hundreds of thousands of people uh, involved if you can count students, parents, and, and workers. Um, but I think the key question is their place within the social, you know, kind of old fashioned Marxist association in the social division of labor. Because our image of work stoppages oftentimes relies on a certain idea of the, the technical division of labor. That is to say that, mm -hmm. that within a factory, if one part of the labor process or one segment of the labor process is interrupted, the entire process is breaks down. But, um, but teachers, of course, work in incredibly labor intensive environment. There's no, I mean, well, Zoom, I don't know what Zoom is gonna do to uh, teaching. My son's upstairs right now, uh, you know, being bored. <laughs> Bored to tears, I'm sure. Um, but uh, but the fact of the matter is that what teachers do in the classroom hasn't changed much in the last you know 50 to 100 years, despite all the re you know revelatory technologies mm -hmm. that have been imposed upon us. And um, and yet, despite the fact that they're not involved in this kind of key technological sort of node within the economy, their ability essentially to shut down the entire economy by going on strike is really profound, precisely because they also function as childcare. <laughs> right, and I mean, what their function is. Right, exactly. I mean, it's, it's, it's like, and I think that, you know, certainly in the pandemic period, that's, that's a huge part, certainly of the, whatever was going on in LA, um, is that all of our, uh, the question of what happens to those kids <laughs> if they're not at school. And it, we don't know. I mean, they're kind of disappearing <laughs> on some level, right? I mean, like in LA, I think 30% of kids just never showed up on Zoom. So, um, and of course, they're, right now the kids are at home anyway. Uh, they just happen to be plugged into some, you know, <laughs> sort of <laughs> device or whatever. So, um, but I think that's really, really important. So that if you look at the negative, the not negative, that's not the right word, but if you look at the, the features of the old labor movement, which the material conditions for which have seemed to have eroded, one can have a very negative perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, you actually look at what's going on around you and you say, oh, well, okay, what the real task is to figure out what's happening with these, these uh, movements or these revolts and to try to figure out relationships um, between them. Is there a kind of internal kind of infrastructure or armature that links them in some way? And I'm not sure, I certainly haven't figured that out, but I'm very, um, certainly this summer was a, was a really important moment for me in terms of thinking about um, the near future and its possibilities. So. Well, a couple of things you mentioned make me want to push this in, in an even more speculative direction. And you mentioned on the one hand, the Gilets Jaunes and their peculiarly American near hinterland features. And the other, you also mentioned the uh, uprisings in, about the police this yeah. summer. Uh, and. I thought it might be interesting. Had, had you, have, you, have you thought about how, you know, we have two we have two two phenomena here which on the surface seem to be operating completely independently of each other. One is Black Lives Matter and the uh, protests against police brutality, and which also carries with it the protesting in general against all the institutions. <laughs> of, um, white supremacy, even though yeah. it has been focused specifically on the police. Um, on the other hand, we have the stagnation of wages, the decline in the bargaining power of workers because of their, uh, because of the failure of mechanization to continue and increase productivity, um, and the, the emergence of new forms of struggle and a new, new kinds of workers movement among these surface workers. Um, but these two seem to be, even though we're talking about the same social system and we're even to a large extent talking about exactly the same people. Yeah. You know, when we talk about the victims of white supremacy, we're also talking about a lot of people who work in um, packing house, meat packing plants, uh, you know, um, 
women from Central America or Somalis sure. in the middle in the, in the in the Midwest. And when we talk about UPS workers, we're talking a lot a lot of African Americans as well as a lot of European Americans. But so we're even talking about it, the same people facing in a way the uh, equally oppressive aspects of one social system. It makes me think of a photograph I saw of some little band of people in Denver, Colorado, of all places, called the Denver Communists. There are probably 12 of them. They were yeah, all there. They I had their sign up. It was a great sign. It said, defund, disarm, and defeat the police. <laughs> that was a defeat in very large letters. And then on the bottom, it had, it's to, to describe the police, that slave catchers, strike breakers, and I thought, okay, they put it together. They, they've yeah. taken these two things and said, it's, this is one system actually, which has these different faces. Do you see anything, do you see any signs of any of this, of that recognition emerging, or do you see a possibility of that emerging in the future or the near future? Right yeah, now, I don't think it's been I, calmed down by the elections, Yeah, but, but the future lies ahead. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, one of the things that I, I, I've, I've thought a lot about um, is the is the viability of the, of the strike as a, as a kind of collective action. Mm -hmm. It's something that my friend uh, Joshua Clover has written very interestingly about um, in his book, um, Riot Strike Riot. And um, what's interesting on some level, of course, is, you know, the kind of basic given of all the people involved in all these struggles, whether they're anti-police struggles or whether they're uh, teacher struggles or what have you, um, is that they're all wage laborers and they all um, work in sort of conditions that uh, they would want to in some, sa some sense uh, transform or reshape or what have you. Um, they're all subject to the kind of overarching pressures of wage stagnation that, um, that workers suffer from. And yet for the most part, with the exception of teachers for reasons that we've sort of touched on, they find the place from which to struggle is not the workplace. And so mm -hmm. the question is, why is that the case? Why aren't people just revolting in workplaces across the country? And I think that's a really, really important um, question to raise. To some extent, it, it, mm -hmm. it comes back to this question of the servant class and the kind of dispersion of the class across spatial sites. So that what you end up with is smaller and smaller workplaces, uh, mm -hmm. workplaces that are less capital intensive. So that if you go on strike and you're at a haircutting uh, salon, you don't immobilize very much capital, right? Maybe the, uh, the rent, the commercial rent or what have you is, is part of uh, the equation there, but you're not arresting large mm -hmm. quantities or large masses of value in motion, right? Um, so, so, and I think that that's something that's intuitively quite obvious to people who are involved in these struggles. Um, it, is, it is interesting that, for example, someone like Kim Moody, who's a really, really interesting uh, Kind of labor historian uh, who I, I read a lot and, and think a lot about and try to constantly work through his ideas. He seems to think that you know, in fact, we, we're in a just-in-time economy that's in, that's entirely or increasingly kind of networked into this kind of fragile kind of spider web-like sort of structure, and so that any, particularly people in the just-in-time logistics uh, sector or kind of um, framework, have this incredible power to interrupt the economy. He even thinks that, for example, uh, he says in one interview, which I, I cite in the book because I don't understand what he means. He, he refers <laughs> even to like hospitals and uh, big box stores as the quote factories of today. And by he means a lot of things by that. There's lots, so, so apparently there's lots of capital that's made. He gives these, these statistics, which are, which are uh, questionable about uh, capital intensity and that sort of thing. And, you know, hospitals, uh, workplace sizes. I mean, again, he, he fudges everything in this kind of funny way to get it to come out, you know, to get the equation to come out the way he wants it. Um, but there is this idea that, you know, for someone like him, we should be seeing a kind of, not only a, a kind of resurgence of workplace struggles because of the kind of imbrication of all the kind of, uh, what's the word, the arteries or the, the uh, mm -hmm the kind of network nature of production along these kind of extended value chains. Um, and we also should see something like a rise in, you know, the industrial unionism of the thirties. That's what he, you know, that's what he and his people yeah. that politically aligned with him make this argument. And I try to, I try to make it a different kind of argument, but that's, that there's a reason why people find workplaces less and less amenable to the kinds of, um, uh, 
labor or collect collective action that was so um, uh, was so um, extraordinary and, and uh, important in like let's say the 1930s, 40s, and 50s in, in the in the big industries in the U.S. And so that's the question you have to. I think you have to kind of like not fantasize <laughs> that that's not the case, but rather try to figure out why that's the case. And to some extent, I try to do that in the book a little bit by talking about this kind of um, devolution in some sense of the economy towards this sort of spatial dispersion. And again, the, the way in which labor is, is continually being reallocated towards more labor intensive and therefore less capital intensive, smaller workplaces, which makes the, the, the conditions under which organizing and acting together uh, are possible, um, more tenuous. So, but I, I you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, again, I think the task for, for everyone um, listening and otherwise is to try to figure out the connections between these things. And, and there are connections for sure, because we live in a, you know, we live in a totality. We don't live in a, a dispersed kind of uh, fragmented world. These are all, there's these kind of mediations that are connecting these things. But well, um, maybe but that's a good inflection point to open up to a more general discussion. Okay, and all right. So if people, I, I will, I will stop you, there because I think that was uh, it actually you you've gone very very far from the the, the productivity paradox to right. the we can get back to that if people want workplace to workplace yeah. that we live in, and I think that all you can see that we're dealing with a very large totality that you're right. exploring in this book, and maybe people will have questions and comments to make. Yeah, that'd be great. Malika, I think you're in charge of this. Yes, thank you both so much. Um, we have probably a record-breaking number of questions lined up for you. So I hope <laughs> you're you're ready for this Q&A. Do some just as long as Just as long as Paul will answer them. No, 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 <laughs> you have to answer them. <laughs> okay, so our first question will come from Gerardo, Gerardo Munoz, who I believe I'm reading the question on their behalf. Um, uh, but I think this is like the perfect question to open up this conversation. The question okay. is, Gerardo says, great conversation. And I'm looking forward to reading Jason's book. When Jason talked about the transformation of class composition, I wanted to see if you could say something about the transformation of the service economy in relation to the topological problem of the metropolis, which seems to be the spatial, even civilizatory uh, or civilizational organization of this specific financial transformation. It seems that this was the case of the Zhejiang. It was a counter metropolitan revolt, but I could also think here of the Chilean revolt of 2019, which really started as an exodus against the subway of Santiago. Now it seems that's that this count, right? Sorry, yeah, that's great, yeah. You, you see this, like why this question goes yeah, first. Um, uh, yeah, so touching on the Chilean revolt 2019, which really started as an exodus against the subway of Santiago. Now it seems that this counter metropolitan contestation in the United States is still in an immature phase. They really have been in metropolitan areas, but not against the metropolis as such. Do you see this sort of anti-metropolitan experiential contestation emerging in the wake of the rise of the tech sedimentation? Uh, okay, I, I, I think this is a great question. Um, I think that your the, the question relies on a notion of the metropolis, probably that requires a bit of uh, unpacking, and that sort of makes a you know reference to a, a kind of uh, you know conceptual lineage that maybe is not uh, totally obvious to everyone, maybe not entirely obvious to me. I, the question, I guess, I would I would sort of rephrase the question by saying, was the Gilets Jaunes an anti metropolitan or at anti-metropolis struggle. Um, I think that's really, really interesting. I think the Chilean answer is, or the Chilean situation, which I don't know as well as Rardo, I'm sure he, he could say a lot about that, uh, is probably a better example. But I'm not, I'm not entirely sure that's the case. I tend to think of the notion of the metropolis as having a kind of Italian, I don't know, kind of post-workerist uh, idea that in some sense, it's not simply that um, the labor process or industry, uh, you know, capitalist industry has been really subsumed by capitalists who are constantly transforming the labor process and, and, uh, and through technological change, uh, inducing, you know, higher productivity within work sites. But in fact, the, the subsumption that's taken place is a subsumption of society itself. So that all of society, of capitalist society is somehow reflecting or has been reprogrammed or redesigned in the image 
of the labor, pro the immediate labor process itself. And so that's why you get something like not the city, but the metropolis. And the metropolis is not merely something that would be opposed to the rural, um, but as a kind of network, it's not even necessarily, I think the word topo topological was used. It's not simply kind of an easily, it's not a, a place that's opposed spatially to something like the rural and therefore to the peasantry and so on and so forth. That being said, it seems to me that the term metropolis, if I understand you correctly, um, sort of flattens out some of the differentiations that sort of emerge within the uh, Gilets Jaunes movement or the, the Gilets Jaunes movement in some sense kind of italicizes. And by which I mean that in some sense, there's this idea that it's not the suburbs, it's not the urban core, but it's not the rural uh, or merely provincial either. That the Gilets Jaunes movement is in large part a, a, a revolt of people who live within a very, very differentiated and increasingly important stratum uh, of society, which is both a kind of class stratum as well as a kind of spatial location. I think it's really important for American uh, politics too to think about this sort of exurban or near hinterland. Again, I think Phil's Neil's term is really, really good to think about the role that they play or it plays within uh, class struggle, even, even just like electoral politics uh, on some level. So, um, so that's kind of like my way of answering that really interesting and complicated question, which I'll have to digest a bit more, is that I'm not entirely sure the term metropolis is the right term to describe that against which the Gilets Jaunes were revolting. Um, I think there's a more differentiated and um, articulated kind of spatial, but also kind of class dynamic involved. Um, but I would be willing to have that conversation uh, more. I don't know if that answers the question, but that's a comment on the question, maybe. I would love to actually turn this question back over to Paul. Um, actually, I would rather just go on to the next question because I, I pretty much agree with Jason. And my problem with it is that it's a really great question. And to really discuss it would take us another hour and a half. <laughs> so I think what's, what's happened is to it, the question has been raised. Everybody can see why it's interesting and important to think about, yeah. but we're not going to come to the end of it here. And if we started, I think that would be the end of everybody else who wants to ask a question. But, but I think that in the future, there will be more discussion along those lines, I hope, like uh, in a different context. But, but clearly, uh, let me just make one comment. So now, that, now that you've got my <laughs> mouth open, I can't shut it. So the, my, my, other, my other comment is that, you know, clearly there is some major crisis of the city going on. Mm -hmm. I, I myself am not a user of the, of the concept of the metropolis, but I can see that the whole relationship between cities and suburbs and cities and countryside is in flux at the moment and very, very unstable. Who, uh, who lives in cities and what they're for? You know, I live in a city now which is 30% empty. It basically, much of the center of Manhattan is basically a site for money laundering for foreign <laughs> gangsters from Russia and China and Sweden and every, you know, that's what it's for. All they're that's doing London as well, right? Laundering I mean. money by buying apartments for $40 billion, million dollars and selling them to each other. So it's not, it's unclear what you can, you can see if you even walk around, it's hardly even a city anymore. The stores are closed, you know, nobody can go to school. <laughs> every, you know, it's absolutely astonishing. that so New York, which was once kind of the great world city, it's just completely finished. It's not a city. And so, and I assume that something like that is, you can see it in Paris, which yeah, I, when I used to go to Paris 20 years ago or 30 years ago, you thought, oh my God, we're, I love the 19th century here. The working <laughs> class lives better in Paris than a billionaire can live in New York. You can go to a market and get some peasant has come in with with, you know, on a donkey with some carrots, the best carrots you ever, and you go there now, it's the same people from Russia, from China, from New York, from Stockholm, buying apartments for $2 million and selling them to each other. The whole city is being destroyed. So something is changing in the relationship between city, the rest of, and the rest of the world. And I have, I don't know what it is because I haven't sat down and spent the five years it would take to try to figure it out. But clearly this is a very interesting and important question, which has enormous consequences for thinking about the future of social change. I knew you had something to say. 
<laughs> Sorry. Gotcha. Um, oh, our next yes. question comes from Joshua, who will pose it to you directly. Yeah, hi. First, thanks, Brooklyn Rail, uh, for hosting this, for uh, uh, Malvika and Paul and every, everyone. And thanks, Jason, for the, the great talk. It was really interesting, and I'm super excited about the book. Um, I want to ask this question, sort of in the context of debates around surplus population and so on, which is in reading sort of the, the debates around automation, in addition to your own work, um, I've noticed a sort of confusion that propagates where the profits of automation tend to describe it as being the replacement of entire lines, right? So there's some job someone does, and then a robot comes along and does that entire job, and that line of work vanishes, and those people are disemployed. And then the critics say, well, that, that hasn't happened. Accurately so. Uh, but that tends to disguise a far more common form of, of technological replacement of work, right? Where some widget, not a robot, not an entire you know, figure, just a widget comes along that makes labor more efficient. And so instead of having 10 seamstresses or bricklayers or whatever, you would have seven to do the same work. Yeah. Um, and, and then people are disemployed that way. Now, and, and that tends to be effaced by the, the full line replacement debate. I'm wondering if your argument is, is, as it seemed at the beginning, that that second kind, more common kind of technological replacement of labor also isn't happening, uh, which is to say thusly that there is no production of surplus population, that's not happening, employment rates are staying stable, relatively speaking. So I'm a little unclear about your case about the, the overall picture of technological replacement of labor over the last uh, 50 or 60 years, post-war period, loosely, um, and how you would articulate that. So yeah. I just want to ask you to, to talk about that a little bit more. Thank you for putting up with a long question. No, that's great. I, I'll have a much longer answer, I think. Um, the uh, I think that, you know, I, I think that maybe for propaganda reasons, maybe, uh, for kind of promotional reasons, I would say that the important thing is to say that technological change um, will not produce mass unemployment. That's the key. And the, and the figure of mass unemployment, I should say that it's very, very common in the rhetoric around automation uh, in contemporary sort of you know, popular press and in uh, books that are published uh, by um, respectable presses. Um, that, that figure of mass unemployment was very, very common in the discussions about automation in the 50s. So for example, if you read Friedrich Pollock's book on automation, which I fantasize in some sense has some relationship to what I wrote, um, you'll see that there's, there's just a, any catalogs, a, a, you know, a kind of, it's just uh, reams of soci sociologists and senators and industrialists and business people all talking about the prospect of mass, uh, mass unemployment. So the question is, what's the difference between mass unemployment and the phenomenon you're talking about, which is a kind of 50 year process in which certain industries, for example, experience over that, so over several decades, uh, lower and lower demand for labor, right? And that's certainly the case in, 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 in particular industries. On the other hand, um, so, so I, as I said, I think in the beginning of my discussion, I mean, there's not good, mass unemployment is what happens in massive economic crises. Um, technological unemployment is something that happens in short-term cyclical burst usually, right? When you have certain industries being disrupted or somehow being reformatted and labor is expelled from that industry, but it's almost always absorbed, not entirely. And Marx makes this point, it's not a compensation theory, but Marx makes the point that there's always a process of reallocation of labor because new industries and new, let's say, uh, the mechanization of, of existing industries always produces supplementary or ancillary industries, which then in some sense absorb at least part of that labor, right? So when Marx talks about surplus populations, he's not talking about the mere expulsion of people. Uh, and we're, again, we're talking about England, right? In the, in, the, in the 19th century. And I think that to some extent, my framework maybe uh, doesn't account um, sufficiently for some of the larger global dynamics that, um, that are clearly in play here. Um, but the point is that there's not a kind of, there's not the claims that are being made for the effects of automation on the labor market um, are wildly incoherent. And they are both theoretically incoherent, but also do not map onto any kind of historical um, pattern that we've seen. And so, yes, I, I would say that the quote unquote reserve army has expanded over the last 
40, 50 years, right? I don't know if I would call them surplus populations because that seems to suggest a separate kind of group of people uh, or sociological category, even though I know that's not what it means. Um, but I, I guess the point I was making simply is that when you have moments of technological change, what you really have is changing class composition. You have jobs that are redefined. And so that, for example, one task is automated, but other tasks are sort of integrated into that job, um, a bank teller, for example, and so on and so forth. And that's a very complex process. Um, and it's oftentimes quite disruptive, um, but it's not one in which the, the foremost kind of specter is not one of mass uh, unemployment. Mass unemployment is what happens in the 1930s. It happens in 2008. Um, so I think that's sort of my answer. I mean, I, I don't know if, again, I, I think that it's quite crude the way that I put it, because I'm really trying to push back against the way that the drumbeat around the relationship between automation and unemployment is formulated in the, uh, in the um, again, in the books that are much better known than mine will probably be, but also uh, the kind of journalistic rehashing of those books arguments that you see every day in Wired Magazine, New York Times, and so on and so forth. So if, if I could just ask a quick follow-up of that, Mal said it was okay. So I'm, I'm, okay. Going, I'm going with it. And I don't want to mess up your, your, uh, your book propaganda. Um, okay. But it, it seems that if you admit that absorption is incomplete when, when lines are, when, you know, when, when, uh, when certain uh, um, subsectors of the economy do tend to empty out of employment, if absorption is incomplete, uh, which it is, um, th then that would imply an ongoing uh, increase, absolutely and relatively, of this population who will never find wage labor. Now, that's distinct from the, those episodes of mass unemployment you talk about, but there can still be those moments of massive increase in crisis and a secular increase, absolutely and relatively, in people who will never find regular wage labor. So it seems to me you've just argued that there is that increase if, if absorption is incomplete. By definition, that has to be true. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, the last chapter of, of, of my book, I think it's the last chapter, it's called An Absolute Law. And the term absolute law is actually used by Marx in the chapter 25 to describe the process you're, you're, you're describing. So I, 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 I totally agree with that. I mean, I think it's just orthodox uh, position on some level that hopefully maybe you articulate a little better than I do. Um, what I would say though, is that there's a, there's a kind of long-term uh, developmental pattern that you're describing. Um, and I think that to some extent, the exact shape of that pattern as you know, that we see empirically today is, is, is a question that we could all kind of look at and probably have different points of view on. Um, I think the political implications are also, which you've, you've written quite ably and um, provocatively and importantly about, um, those are also on the table as well. But I think that the actual process you're describing is totally, uh, is the one that's actually under, underway. Uh, again, I think that what I was trying to do is try to kind of subtly sort of differentiate different effects that automation in various sectors are going to have on the larger, on the larger labor market, that's all. Um, I don't know if it's, uh, again, I think the term surplus population uh, is a really, really uh, important one. And it has, of course, its source in, in Marx. But it's, um, it can sometimes lead to misunderstandings on the part of people who are having discussions about what that means, uh, not only in terms of you know, historically and sociologically, but also in political terms. And so I guess that's why I, I, um, I probably avoid that because it's, for me, a, a way of um, forcing myself to try to rearticulate something um, that I think is important. So, but thank you for your question. I mean, I, I totally, I think we, I think we agree um, in large part. Thank you so much. Um, and now to resume our book propaganda programming. Uh, <laughs> our next question, I think we'll come a little bit back to topics of revolution and sort of uprising. And actually I'm so thrilled comes from our poet laureate for this event, uh, Brendan right. Johnson, um, who I think is, you know, also seems to foreground labor uh, from what I have read and heard. So Brendan, take it away. Hey, my name is Brendan Joyce. Uh Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, it's okay. Uh, I am asking this question in relation to uh, the conversation you were having earlier about struggles, but also in relation to the current mass unemployment crisis in the United States <clears throat> and the government's uh, stimulus response. Um, as a restaurant worker, organizer, and now in 
per permanently unemployed worker yeah. organizer. <laughs> Uh, we're seeing a mass refusal, yeah, right, directly as in relation to the COVID crisis. Um, we're seeing a mass refusal of former restaurant workers who are currently unemployed to return to work. Um, and I guess my question is, how does this relate to maybe these new frontiers of worker struggles, where instead of the workplace being um, the restaurant, the workplace is now filing weekly claims from home and the refusal to return to work is the only leverage left um, that these workers have. Well, I would just simply point out, I, I, I'm interested in the way you formulate that, right? Is that, of course, people, the idea that restaurant workers uh, would refuse to return to work is something that I, um, I understand um, as, a, as, a, as an idea, but I don't know much about it. So if you have more to say about that, it'd be interesting. Because I, I could, I mean, for example, one element of the refusal surely has to do with the fact that people don't want to get sick and die um, <laughs> by working, right? And that's a, something that a lot of workers are sort of experiencing over the last eight, 10 months, whatever it's been at this point, uh, is that they, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, work or work and, you know, be exposed to a fatal <laughs> bug or, uh, or not work. But if you have more to say about the refusal part, because it's very interesting, because in some sense, one could imagine a scenario in which, in which that work is just simply not available to a lot of people uh, across well, the U.S. And so it wouldn't be characterized as refusal, but rather simply a kind of lack of demand. So could you say more about that? Right. So, I mean, both are happening, right? So right. folks are getting recalled to their jobs and restaurants that okay. obviously cannot operate safely and yeah, refusing sure. to return to work. Now, that's a very different interaction than, you know, their former jobs just not existing anymore um, mm -hmm. and not being able to recall, yeah. be recalled. But the refusal is something that I wouldn't have anticipated, especially considering unemployment benefits, the expanded unemployment benefits have run out. But still, right. in organizing, I'm seeing it. Um, and it's also kind of wild because when you refuse to work in American unemployment systems, you lose your unemployment. Yeah. Um, but folks are choosing that instead of returning to work. Uh, again, this, you know, I, I just don't know where to put it. I don't know what to make of it. Um, especially because this isn't the 1930s, the CPUSA is an established unemployment councils that work right. nearly as well as they did in the 30s. So I just wanted to throw it out there. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting phenomenon. I, I don't know what to say uh, about it. I think that um, people are uh, confronting the possibility that there isn't going to be a restaurant uh, industry of anything resembling what we had before. Um, uh, but yeah, I don't know. And of course there's lots of risks that people are willing to take uh, under the circumstances that uh, I find really admirable, uh, but also in some sense um, pointing towards the future, right? I mean, on some level, maybe the 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 situation we find ourselves in, which is a real highly artificial one, we should we should say, right? I mean, like on some level, the fact that there's mass unemployment in in March is because the government stepped in and, and sort of shut down the economy essentially, right? And refused to let businesses operate. That's a little bit different than the kind of longer term dynamics of uh, the production of a kind of whatever unemployed layer um, of the workforce. Um, but I do think that something's going to, I mean, strange things are going to emerge out of this process. I think that um, whether or not the kinds of activity you're talking about or actions you're talking about directly bear on the situation as it stands now, or whether they point the way towards something that might unfold in a year or two or, or five is that would be the question I, I have, you know, because on some level, you know, people are going to have to do what they have to do uh, in a situation where um, unemployment benefits are going to dry up. Uh, work, uh, at least working safely is not going to be possible. And that's going to produce um, repercussions for people. And they'll do what, again, they're not going to take it lying down, right? They're going to, to act uh, in a way they feel is necessary to, um, survive, if not ameliorate those conditions. So I think it's an important, I think I think it's really something that, of course I wrote this <laughs> before this all happened. Uh, and so I was a bit, I'm sort of, I'm still reeling from everything to be honest. In fact, I'm still reeling from May and June to be perfectly frank. Um, uh, and so how to incorporate these really historically unprecedented experiences into the kind of vision that I had tried to articulate is, is hard. Um, so. That's all I can say about that. Thanks. 
Thank you so much both for that question and that response. Um, next, we will go to our friend in Detroit, Lynn Crawford. Lynn, you can turn on your microphone now. Thank you. Um, I, I think I um, will echo what other people say. I feel like we could have a whole series of talks around this topic. It's fascinating and important. And in fact, I think um, this is maybe too big a question to tackle right now, but you keep mentioning Marx and I'm just curious if you have um, like what you think someone like Herbert Marcuse might say about something like this, you know, like, or if you, you know, one dimensional man and I mean, did, yeah. he, did he sort of foresee some of this? And again, this might be too big a topic to take on now, but that sort of economic um, forecast and also the interest in combining it with psychology. Um, you know, I, well, I, I will say, I, I can't speak to Marcuse myself. Uh, I, I, for whatever reason, I, I, I have an aversion to Marcuse and I think it has a lot to do with the, the kind of redolence of the early 60s kind of capitalist triumphalism actually that I, that I read in, in the book. I also see bits and pieces of um, the kind of sociology of the time uh, in the book, which I find pretty unconvincing, but that's not, I'm not saying that's the correct <laughs> position. I'm saying that's my position. So I can't really Really say much about Marcuse. The one thing I would say, though, is I think the integration of a kind of, let's say, an analysis that deals with political economy um, combined with an analysis that deals with some of the subjective dimension of the crisis of the last, um, whatever, 10 years or 12 years or whatever it has been, uh, is important. And in some, to some extent, I deal with this just a, a touch on a little bit in the uh, in one of the chapters of the book. It's called an army of shadow, or army of shadows. I think it's called. Because I deal a little bit with the um, the the labor, the decline in the labor participation rate amongst American workers. That is to say, the, the that percentage of the population which is able to work but which is not involved in either having a job or looking for a job. So, and this is a this is a kind of uh, phenomenon which is quite interesting over the course of since the '70s to the present. In particular, there's a question of. Uh, I mean, there's been a lot of discussion in amongst. Um, Sociologists, but also, you know, in uh, the academy in various ways, uh, about the gendered nature of that uh, withdrawal, if you like, of labor or that withdrawal from the labor market. And um, I think, uh, including lots of right wing commentators who uh, who see the kind of withdrawal of male m men, oftentimes young men, from the labor market as as in some sense a kind of crisis of the of the family and a crisis of the patriarchal kind of gender. Um, system or structure, um, but it's very much in the, in the again, particularly on the right, on the right um, for reasons that maybe are obvious. Uh, so there's something a little, I, I address those kinds of questions a little bit in that chapter um, in the book, um, but I think that that ambition and that kind of synthetic vision that Marcuse has is pretty admirable. I just can't do it. I think it's because he's a, you know, he was a student of Adorno, so, <laughs> or whatever, a student of, uh, I, maybe not a student or Adorno, but a, someone who belonged to that kind of tendency within uh, 20th century Marxism that, that uh, insisted upon integrating all these all these elements into a kind of total vision of administered society. So it's a very good question. I, 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 yeah, I don't know about Marcuse. Thank you. Sure. I think it might be worthwhile to have a full event on Marcuse. And, and I, move I think to there's probably people in the audience who are, who are real experts. We should get them in there. <laughs> we'll poach our experts from the audience. Um, our next question comes from our very own publisher and captain of this fine ship, Fong H. Bui. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Mavika. Thank you, Paul. I have a question relating to um, what Lynn just spoke of. Uh, Makusa, the book came out in 1964, One yeah. Man, and it's not quite true. He's a colleague of O'Donnell. Right. Yeah, no, I, I, I try to yeah. correct myself. But definitely. A oh, he was a <laughs> yes, absolutely. But in relating to art, though, however, Jason, because you write about art, too. Yeah. About art, as you do with other philosophical issues, as I do occasionally, certainly with my friend here, Paul, certainly have written about art as well. And Paul's father, in fact, have probably known um, 
uh, Makuza, Paul, is that true? What your father came to? They America? were quite good friends, and my father actually wrote a critique of the long critique, book, right? which Marcuse yeah. thought was the only serious book written against him. So, <laughs> exactly. yeah, they had a they had a fairly good relationship. Exactly, and so it's tied together in the orbit of our immersive interest, Jason. Right. This is how I met. Or two. Family business. Yeah. <laughs> so we have a mutual friend, a great art historian, Mai Shapiro, who was also a great friend of Paul's father and mother. So it's all tied back to our interest in politic and art as indivisible elemental way of living in the fuller sense, you know? My question is very interesting because I just finished the first volume of Joseph Stalin by Stephen Cockin. Ah, okay. Yeah, it's called Paradox of Power, dating the day the, the year he was born in 18, um, 80, 78 till 28, 1928, the year, the beginning of collectivization. So I learned more about the complexity, and Pope can also join in and make comments here, of how reversal their role was. In other words, Stalin, who were the, 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 the people come for nationalities, whereas Trotsky was the commissar of the, the army. It's so ironic, you know, Paul, the reversal of the two where, you know, we know that in a way association with Trotsky had been so much relating to the removal or the elite intellectualism, even though he's much more eloquent speaker and wrote on art criticism and literary criticism and whatnot, the opposite of um, Stalin, you know, who, who never really did any of that, uh, who joined Hitler later to coin the famous term, you know, uh, decadent art or, you know, uh, degeneration, degenerated art and whatnot. So my point is, we are at a very interesting time. Where does the function of art where it fell in Soviet Union, I mean, of course, Stalin knew it was happening when uh, Lenin experienced his fourth stroke, right, Paul? So Lenin died in, in the summer of 1922, and that was the end of the aspiration, the communist utopia. My point is that we experienced a little bit in the 30s uh, where Eleanor Roosevelt really prompted FDR to create the WPA, especially the, the Federal Project One. Would it be possible uh, the distribution, distribution of labor and the emphasis on the, the art can be somehow resurrected as potential for job? I don't mean just uh, for culture, so to speak. Right. That's my question. Okay. Uh, Paul, do you want to? <laughs> no, no you, you teach at an art college. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, the idea that you'd have a kind of 30s style um, job creation program uh, that would also incorporate, you know, working artists, Philip Gustin, Jackson Pollock, all these people who became, you know, sort of exemplary figures of the American 50s uh, re re requires that you have a certain vision of, of what the state's capacity to intervene economically and socially, uh, socially might be. And I think that's one that is, that ship has definitely sailed. Um, of course you had in the seventies, you had like lots of arts funding, for example. I mean, it's one of the interesting things about the seventies in New York is that all the, or much of the most interesting art that was being produced was being produced in the context of these so-called alternative spaces uh, in which you had this, on the one hand, this kind of massive economic crisis. Remember, uh, you know, New York, it's, what is it, drop dead? Uh, Ford says to New York, but at the same time, there was, you know, there was arts funding flooding into, uh, into the city, both at the city level, the state level and, and federal funding. So you have places like artist space and, and so on and so on, PS1, all these places, mm -hmm. right? That world is totally demolished. I mean, it's not even a kind of, uh, it's a historical sort of thing that we can sort of look at. Um, and on some level, I think that the, the question of where the art world is in relationship to the actual real dynamics of, of American or kind of global capital society is a real um, is a real problem. And some level, I think that I mean, again, I I, I have lots of fr very good friends actually uh, and colleagues who are artists, and I, I I hang out with them all the time, and they're amazing. Uh, and they're also going through the same kind of 
uh, searching, I think. Um, but I think on some level, you know, what Paul said about cities mm -hmm. can be said about art, right? Which is to say that you have this, particularly the crisis we're in now, the, the, the strange uh, sort of parenthesis that we find ourselves in now, the, the real function of, of the great metropolitan centers, London and New York and Paris and that sort of thing has been revealed in some sense. That on some level, they're not this kind of node within this kind of extraordinary uh, social and historical experiment, um, but rather there are these kind of, it's a, a place where assets uh, are sort of, you know, housed and uh, where the value of those assets is sort of pumped up through monetary policy and and so on and so forth. And that's what the city has become. So the question is, is that what art's become? Is art the analog of the city? Is there is there some kind of intimate connection between real estate? It's also for money laundering. Right, well, I was, I was, that's essentially what I was, <laughs> I was suggesting, right? It's like, I think that um, art is in some sense, the, the fate of art and the fate of real estate, particularly in New York City, uh, really has to be thought together in a kind of way um, that uh, would be productive. And I think that on some level, that was the case in the 70s in a very different sense. I mean, look at what the 70s looked like, right? You have these kind of demolished uh, uh, tenement buildings that are just literally in rubble, uh, rats running everywhere. And then you have this kind of, you know, a sort of stripped down kind of punk uh, aesthetic coming out of places like Colab and places like that. That's not what you have now, right? You have these kind of gleaming towers and you have the art to match. The gleaming towers that are empty because they're owned by oftentimes, uh, you know, oligarchs uh, from wherever. And so American and otherwise. And so I think that's the, that's the question that art has to struggle with. Of course, there's all sorts of interesting things happening in, in the art world um, that have nothing to do with that. And I, I talk about it with students all the time, uh, but I do think that's the, that's the dilemma that art has to face is are we essentially a kind of asset class uh, that whose, whose development now is tied to kind of asset bubble type of logic, just like real estate. Yeah, that's, so, a, that's a real dilemma. Yeah, no, it's not. It's never been a dilemma. I mean, artists are resilient to be able to adapt with any given condition. I mean, this is what we learn in, in Scandinavian culture, countries where declaring yourself as an artist, you get incredible uh, governmental yeah, that's, supports. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't drive the artist to make great art. I mean, many of my friends in Denmark and Sweden complain to me about this, you know? Uh, my, my uh, yes, I, as I'm about to prepare for my interview with Tiesta Gates, there's a lot of different prospect and, and imagining possibility, what, what that means. So I'm trying to think about that. One last thing though, which I love to share to Paul and you is that we tend to forget that Makusa Paul work, work for the, the Office of Strategic Service and to the CIA. CIA. That's right. Well, Afterwards. that's the of CIA. That's why we don't quite trust them. But anyway, <laughs> well, back to you, Rebecca. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> thank you all so much. Um, I feel like preparing for one's conversation with the Astro Gates is like the perfect metaphor for this, this discussion we're having right now about sort of the, the what you were saying about the fate of art and the fate of real estate being combined, um, not to get too personal, but I'm tuning in from the south side of Chicago where the Astro Gates has, uh, has excelled <laughs> both at the same time. So right. um, I, I would love to swerve actually here. We've, we're, we've moved to, to thinking about art and commodity, but we have a very lovely question about art and uh, art and labor. Um, so I'd love to go to Michael Krasowitz, who you can turn on your microphone now. Hello, this is a brilliant conversation. And this is a conversation we have over the dinner table almost every day with my family um, in some form or another. Um, recently, I went, I drove through a Trump rally and it was fascinating to experience. But I, yet last night I was uh, listening to a lecture about Millet and his, uh, his uh, paintings, The Solar and The Gleaners. And I was wondering um, what would be the equivalent to The Solar and The Gleaners today? Uh, I don't know. I think you, you have to answer that Let, or someone else can answer that. Like, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure people, I mean, the, 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 you know, the peasantry itself as a kind of social force in category is, is one that um, in some sense belongs to that moment. Like, but maybe there's other people who have. The reason, the reason I'm asking is because when you said servant, service as servant, 
and that kind of thing. I feel that in my, my understanding of that is that it's creating a perpetual underclass, an underclass of servants to the wealthy, and that the middle class is being dissolved. And I think that when Mie made, made these paintings, it had a profound effect on the middle class and the, uh, I guess, the professional class to make change. And that's why I'm asking that question, whether there's some kind of equivalent that would, would create some kind of a change within our culture so that maybe the wealthy people would think more about redistributing wealth and that kind of thing. Well, I think that, I think honestly, uh, and again, I, all my best friends are artists, um, but uh, I think that, you know, what we saw in May, late May and early June is much more likely were it able to sustain itself or, or maybe take some kind of mutate into slightly different form maybe in certain cases is more likely to provoke um, not rumination, but real, a real response on the part of the, the capitalist class or the, the wealthy or what have you. Um, I don't think that um, the, an ideological kind of cultural front, if that's the right way to put it, um, would be that effective in the current context. First of all, I should just say the bourgeoisie, if, if, if let's, let's call it the capitalist class, I don't know if it gets to call itself the bourgeoisie anymore. Uh, they've given up on culture. That's, that's the one thing that we should all agree on, that it's not that important to them, except as maybe a kind of asset class or, or what have you. And on some level, I think that um, that's an important feature of contemporary art since the 70s, is there's been just this kind of disinvestiture, to use a term that uh, I picked up, I think from Hal Foster at some point. Um, but there has been a kind of abandonment of the cultural uh, sphere as a kind of place in which the bourgeois class or the bourgeoisie could in some sense articulate its, its vision of the world as if it had one. Um, and uh, I think that's an important part of the equation. So if you, if you accept that as a kind of condition for answering the question, then the question is like, why would cultural uh, activity of the sort you're describing, particularly art, um, uh, why would it have an effect on that class? I, I really feel like there's a kind of material confrontation that is at stake in the question that you're asking. And on some level, one has to exact something from that class rather than convincing it of anything because they have too much at stake in not, in not being convinced, you know? They have apartments and uh, their children and go to very, very pre prestigious schools and intermarry with each other and, and uh, have nice jobs. And so I think that that's, the, um, that's my take on art. I mean, I didn't think we were gonna talk about art today, but of course the context makes it make some sense now that I think about it. Um, but that's sort of my, my feeling. I don't know if that's a pessimistic one, but I, I don't think the cultural um, side of the equation uh, has a great role to play in the kind of transformation that at least I envision. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, our next question will come from Carl Kelleher, who you can turn on your microphone now. Okay. Uh, thank you. And thank you for writing this book mm -hmm. and uh, the hosts for putting this together. Um, so it, my question is, is kind of almost follows out of uh, your last answer, perhaps. Um, your story is one element of the story is capitalism is becoming pretty great at generating more and more, as you put it, industrially organized servant work. And my question is really how you see worker militancy in personal services. Um, so as you were saying, like personal services, they rely on ethical bonds, uh, values like trust and care, nurturing bodies, and withholding that kind of labor would seem to pose really strong ethical tensions that are not there for factory strikes. Like we would not want to do factory work. We would still want to do care work. Uh, so really just like what, what do you think of like care worker militancy would look like if not as strikes? Yeah, well, I think that's the, um, that's, that's the question. I mean, this is a question that was ad addressed at great, great length in kind of the early 70s by kind of Italian feminism. Um, and I think it's something that's really, really at the center of contemporary considerations of what forms struggle can take and what sort of obstacles they encounter. And I think that the, um, you know, I think I touched on that a little bit earlier, right? I mean, like on some level, the question, even if for teachers, right? I mean, like the, a te if you, if, I, I think of something like industrial strikes, I think of a Lordstown, for example, in the early seventies, right? That, you know, workers are just like 
I'm sure it was quite fun on some level to sabotage, you know, Chrysler's or whatever it was uh, by putting a, a pin that rattles in the in the in the dashboard or something like that, or to maybe like not screw in that you know that that bolt as well as you should, so that the cars are essentially not only um, are kind of uh, disasters, but in some sense the the brand itself of Chrysler or whatever. I think for I know when I was a child, Chrysler was considered this awful, just disastrous. Uh, American, you know, industrial product. Um, so I think that's, you know, there's no, there's no love lost in that context, right? Whereas in the, uh, in, the in a care, uh, whatever professions, if you like, um, or those jobs which require that kind of skill, um, there is a kind of deep emotional, um, often, you know, kind of ethical tension involved. And I think that is an obstacle to organizing. But again, I think that the feminist movement in Italy is, is really in some sense, um, the early 70s was uh, very, very attuned to this question. Um, and I think the question might take a slightly different form in the present, uh, but um, I would say that's the place to, to look, Fortunati, people like that. And I'd like to address that question elsewhere. I mean, my book is actually a little bit um, shorter than I originally, <laughs> originally wanted it to be. And I think that's the great virtue in some sense of, of the series is that there is a sense that you have to kind of, you know, pair back and uh, and sort of um, be relatively precise in, in making your argument. But what it meant that it, is that some of those questions that you're addressing, which are really, really important, and which the, the, um, the person from Detroit also asked is, some of those questions had to get sort of pulled away from the larger argument. And uh, I think that they're really, really important. And I hope that when people read the book, they don't think that I'm neglecting those questions. Um, I think they're very important. I'm wondering if I could ask a follow-up question on this sure. just very quickly, um, just because I'm very interested personally on this question, what does the militancy look like for caregivers for this kind of, uh, for this sphere? Um, for those of us who are not familiar with the Italian feminist movement of the 70s, could you give us some brief examples of what, uh, what those counter movements look like or what those counter actions look like? Well, I think the, the question, if I, I'm thinking in particular of something like the wages for housework movement, right? And which, which, in, which was a very complex um, sort of political and theoretical project. But the idea was primarily to mobilize uh, domestic workers, i.e. women who worked in the home without wages, right? Or, or they did it for sort of, it's, the question is on some level, to what extent can we think of the labor taking place in the home primarily done by women and primarily characterized as, as reproductive labor or labor that's not value producing in some sense, that it produces the commodity labor power, um, but it doesn't produce a commodity in the same way that a factory worker at Fiat produces a commodity. So the question is how does one, so, so among those uh, activities of course, are anything from childcare to uh, making food, to washing clothing, but also sex and sexuality and the kind of obligations, uh, oftentimes coercive obligations, particularly in the context of, of uh, Italy um, for uh, for women in their relationship to men in a kind of um, marriage or family kind of legally formatted family situation. And so the question is, what does it mean to with withdraw your labor in a context in which that labor is necessary for the reproduction, not only of a, the working class, but of humanity itself? That is to say that it's, a, it's not simply about reproducing or producing day in and day out someone capable of working at Fiat, but it's also about producing children who will work at Fiat, uh, you know, in 10 years or 15 years, but don't work at Fiat at, at, at the present. And clearly that poses a kind of dilemma. And I think that there's lots of, again, very uh, powerful uh, responses to uh, that dilemma in that movement, which again, I, I can't adequately address uh, even remotely in the, in the context. But I think it's very important for my thinking about what's at stake um, in struggle in the present, even though those, those questions were being formulated in a really a different context in which, for example, in Italy, the early 70s, not only was a legal situation like quite different when it comes to the question of marriage, but also divor divorce, excuse me, but also abortion and so on and so forth, but also women hadn't entered the workforce, the, the kind of waged workforce at the level that even in America, you saw um, this kind of this kind of influx of, of women into um, waged labor, into labor force in the early 70s. That's clearly not the case now. I mean, on some level, the way in which the labor, or, you know, the labor force participation rate has declined since around 2000 is itself 
interesting in the sense that there might be something like a regression towards um, a world in which fewer, for example, women are working outside the house, or at least um, the kind of obligations and the kind of coercions that we think of as um, uh, part and parcel of the kinds of you know domestic patriarchal dynamics of the of the 50s, 60s, and 70s that might be returning in some way, uh, in a form that might be uh, not exactly the same, but it's it's a possibility that's worth exploring. I mean, people have written uh, really, really wonderful and important things on on this um, that I haven't written, so I just want to make that clear. But I do think that that is that is one place to look. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to pose a question to the two of you specifically. Um, that makes it sound like it's a question for the Q&A. The question is this, uh, we're rounding around at 2.50, which is usually when I might introduce the poet, but we have okay. two questions that I really like that I'd love to close on. How are you feeling? Could we take? It's okay with me. Yeah, it's fine with me. That's all right. Okay, great, thank as you. As long as we get the poem. Yeah, of course. <laughs> That's my favorite part. Um, so our next question will come from Nathan P. Uh, I feel like these final two questions are quite thematically linked. Um, so Nathan, you can turn on your microphone now. Uh, hi, Jason and Paul. Uh, thank you so much for having this, uh, this interview. Um, so my question is, uh, you were talking earlier about uh, this ongoing shift toward unproductive labor, um, this sort of secular shift in capitalism. And I was wondering uh, if you think that is indicative of some kind of terminal crisis, uh, or if there's some way in which uh, accumulation could be renewed through some kind of process of capital destruction or something else leading to a restoration of value producing work. And I think this question also relates to a couple earlier ones on like the possibility of uh, restoration of social democracy uh, from uh, I think Jacob Blumenfeld and Pavlos Rufos. So I was just wondering uh, what you what you think about that. Okay, is that do, do you want to do both questions or, or uh, one at a time, Malvika? One at a time might be okay. Yeah, I mean, well, this might be a this is a, probably a Paul <laughs> a Paul question on some level. I mean, I think that on the one hand, uh, the the question that you're pointing at, I think, is this idea of a a kind of secular trend in the profit rate. Um, that is to say that. On some level, there's a relationship here between the rising ratio in relative terms of unproductive activities to productive activities, which insofar as product, unproductive activities are a cost to capital, that is to say they're necessary for circulation of value and for the valorization of value, but they are in some sense not themselves value producing, then that rising ratio of unproductive to productive uh, activities is going to put downward pressure on the profit rate. So the question is, what are the counter tendencies that would, would counteract that pressure, right? Because that, that's really the, the, the issue. And I, I talk about this uh, in the book for sure. I think it's chapter four, uh, four or five, I can't remember. Um, so I'll just say that I, I point to that question. I mean, one of the issues of course is that you have essentially a, a I'm gonna try to say this that doesn't sound too clunky, but you have a kind of differential rate of productivity gains in the two broad sectors. So if you divide the economy into the productive value producing sector or part, and then uh, on the other hand, a kind of unproductive sort of uh, non-value producing part, then th the question is like, why is there a rising ratio of unproductive to productive? And it's because the, the quote unquote productivity in a slightly different sense than Marx, Marx uh, Marx uh, means, uh, the productivity of the unproductive sector, I know this is getting confusing, the unproductivity, <laughs> the productivity of the unproductive sector or, or part of the economy is actually, um, is uh, lagging behind the value producing part of the economy. So if there was some kind of technological change that swept over the, let's say the world of um, restaurants and uh, big box stores and security guards and all the things that nursing and well not nursing maybe uh, for reasons that I want to come back to um, but if there was some kind of technological change there in which the productivity in uh, let's say uh, the kind of conventional sense of the term were to catch up with the productivity uh, gains in the 
value producing sector, then that might actually correct that imbalance between the two, uh, the two parts of the economy, two set broad sectors of the economy. Again, I, I, it's hard for me to reconstitute this now because it's a very abstract and requires sort of uh, differentiating Marx's conception of productivity from the conventional sense of productivity, which itself is kind of split in, in various ways. Um, but I think that that's the issue. And I think that I would point to Fred Mosley's work in particular. It was the one that was most influential for me in formulating uh, the problem. But I think that I try to answer the, the, the dilemma or the problem in a way that's a little bit different uh, than Fred Mosley does. So I don't know if that helps. Paul, maybe you have a, a, a more uh, sort of uh, articulate way to respond to that. Not articulate, but I would say I have a more simple-minded way, perhaps, which is that for capitalism, the crisis, the depression, is the healing process. The fact that there is a the fact that you have a stagnant economy, that fact that you have slowing investment, the fact that productivity is not growing, are all, as Jason said earlier, and as he demonstrates in the book, a result of the failure of capitals to invest. There's huge amounts of cash, but it's not profitable to invest it. That's why instead of investing it in production, it's used to make short-term gains in buying art or real estate or um, just having fun. But um, so it, it, at the same time, you couldn't, you can't say you, you, with one, except for one thing, you could not say that capitalism is finished, even though it is now in a period of long-term stagnation and is, you, it's obviously gotten itself in, a, as, in an economic position, which is very serious and very damaging. In theory, if you just looked at it from the point of view of the three volumes of Marx's capital, in theory, there would be an escape. The escape would mean that the people who run the world would have to really allow to have a full-scale depression like that of the 1930s, but much deeper because now it would involve the whole world. Now it would involve China and India, not just Europe and America. The whole world would have, you would have to have an enormous, you would have to have you know, that enormous unemployment and you would just have to throw people out of the street and let them starve to death in huge numbers. They have been tr avoiding doing this since the middle 1970s when the crisis tendency reasserted itself for the first time after the Second World War. And they're still avoiding it. Every time uh, some, they, the specter of a full board depression uh, shows itself, they get very busy and print more money and hand it out and keep the thing going for another year or two years or three years or now it's sort of three months at a time because they just they, they really don't know what to do other than print another three trillion dollars and hand it out and to keep the banks open for a while longer. So eventually they will try to do this as long as they can. And if they cannot continue or if they miscalculate, then the only, the only alternative would be to really accept a full bore depression. And it is possible that with that level of destruction of capital and that level of destruction of labor, that means killing hundreds of millions of people, it would be possible to reconstitute capitalism, except for one thing, which is at the same time, these idiots have completely destroyed the possibility for life to continue on earth for another right. hundred years with a global warming. That capitalism having based itself on fossil fuels in the, in the 19th century uh, and the fossil fuel industry now being the largest and most powerful of all capitalist industries. They're the top, they're still the, the top earning industries in the United States. They are not going to just say, oh, that would be so sad if humanity died, because that doesn't really, you know, as Keynes said, in the long run, we're all dead. So maybe their grandchildren will have to have to deal with it. But right now, they're not going to deal with it. So they're not going to have a Green New Deal. They're not going to stop economic growth. They're not going to stop burning fossil fuels. And as a result, the Earth is just going to burn up and flood. So it, even apart from the, the tendential fall of the profit rate, People have maybe 50 years to stop capitalism or else you will have the, the same hundreds of millions of people are going to die anyway because the system physically, for the, because of the laws of physics, chemistry, and biology is not going to be able to exist for another hundred years. They have, just, they have now just made it impossible. 
we're you know 20 years from there being from the total disappearance of the water supply of India and South America. We're already very close to a, a level, an extremely high level of disaster. So I think that the possibility of saving capitalism by sacrificing the economy, and that means the working class to uh, reconstitute, reorganize capital to raise the rate of profit and go on for another in indefinite period of time, I think it is very dim because in the meantime, they have created such an enormous and totally insoluble problem. Um, in uh, creating this oncoming uh, ecological catastrophe. So no, I actually, I think capitalism, un unfortunately, I, th I think it's, on, it's near the end. The end is near, as people like to say. It, it really is. That it, it, the system cannot exist anymore. And you can see they even feel, they don't believe in it themselves anymore. That's why partly what you know Jason was saying about the whole they people have lost interest in culture or art and nobody wants to go to the stupid opera anymore, or they don't even want to go to the movies. They just want to stay home and watch Superman reruns on Hulu. You know, the whole the people are just don't know what to do. There is other than to, I don't know buy a new pair of jeans, have fun, and go to a fancy restaurant. And now you can't even do that. Now, they, now they've even made it impossible to have the this, this stupidest of all consumer pleasures. So I think we're in a very serious and difficult moment, and a unique moment in human history because of this very specific dynamic of capitalism and the fatal choice that was made to base the whole economic system on the exploitation of fossil fuels 150 years ago. And now they now this has to be dealt with. People will have to put an end to it or they will just, we will just go out of existence. Well said. For what that's worth. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm trying to think of how to respond to that. I can't. I'm, I'm just, Paul, you're so deeply eloquent about such terrifying things. Um, I would love to go to Jacob Blumenfeld's final question to close, if that's fine. And you can turn on your microphone now. A momentary pause. Here we go. Hello. Hey, Jacob. Hey, what's up? Cheers. Good to you. Uh, my question, thanks for that dark, dark vision, Paul. I really appreciate it. My question is, Jason, you made this kind of structural account of the decline of labor unions, the decline of labor in the post-war period. And I'm wondering if you also read social democracy that way and the decline of social democracy in this kind of, in the structural macro account. And if so, how do you interpret the calls to revive social democracy today, both politically and economically? It's also for Paul, but for both of you guys. Yeah, I'll, I'll be quick and maybe Paul has, a, has another kind of rousing, uh, if terrifying <laughs> answer um, to the question. But I, I think I, I, uh, maybe in a crude terms, I would say my, my perception of the calls for a kind of reinvigorated or kind of uh, resurrected social democracy are the same feelings I have about the calls for a rebirth or a resurrection of the old labor movement. I think they depend on each other uh, pretty profoundly. And um, on some level, the great successes of social democracy, which were, it should be pointed out, were both in some sense uh, achievements of the workers movement, but also in some sense, a kind of self undermining um, result of the struggles undertaken by workers that the, uh, the social democracy depended on a kind of capitalist dynamism, and in particular, the capacity to redistribute in some form the kind of gains that were being made uh, in productivity and also in, in GDP growth, to use that sort of um, not always useful category. Um, and that all of those, that, that the two in some sense um, represent in some sense like uh, part of a single historical phenomenon or configuration in which the labor movement, of course, you can say the labor movement is itself kind of split between a, a kind of accommodationist dynamic that, that struggles internal to uh, the capitalist development in kind of broader terms. Of course, you could say that in fact, it's the labor productivity itself, the gains in labor pro productivity, the kind of compulsory or the demand or the uh, 
ineluctable urge to mechanize labor processes is itself a result of struggles against work uh, in the early phases of the of the um, in the infancy really of the labor movement. Um, that's totally a, a plausible scenario. So that in some sense, the mechanization of labor is a result of workers of is an outcome of worker struggles. Uh, and of course, there's other aspects of the work or there's other dimensions or currents within the, the labor movement, which um, could be seen as opposed to that dynamic or sort of operating in a, in a different framework. Um, so yeah, I mean, so I, I think the, the calls for in, in a way, what's what's fascinating is that is that the rebirth of the labor movement um, in its older form, the kind of industrial unionism of the 30s, for example, uh, or whatever it is, uh, the AFL-CIO, which is hardly a uh, you know, the most um, optimistic vision, if you ask me, of the 50s, um, that those are off the table. And they're off the table for the same reason that uh, social democracy is off the table, because the kind of mech the kind of internal dynamics of capitalist development, but also transformations or, or kind of the decomposition of state capacity um, that we, uh, that I mentioned in passing earlier, um, have all led to a situation in which the only options are, in a certain sense, a kind of um, insurrectionary response to the situation or a kind of further degradation. And I, I don't know if, if that's kind of a, an appealing opposition, but I think that that's, and of course the, the results of that insurrectionary response itself uh, are, are not necessarily promising. Um, I wouldn't wanna say that, but I think that that's, that's the scenario um, we're looking at. And by insurrection, I mean something like um, what we saw in May and June, early June, but on a much, much larger scale um, not only, uh, you know, of course that was taking place across the country in a kind of amazing and still dizzying uh, kind of uh, simultaneity, um, but also at intensity in terms of the, the, the sites that would be um, subject to kind of action, collective action. It wouldn't be simply anti-police struggles, but it might expand elsewhere. Um, so yeah, I think it's off the table entirely. And I think it's really, really a waste of time almost uh, to, to devote oneself to uh, that vision of politics in the present. I think it's a waste of time, almost in, in the kind of marginalist sense of a kind of opportunity cost, you know, like so much effort is being poured into um, both thinking about and sort of programming in some kind of think tank way, a social democratic future, but also uh, just resources, people's intelligence, their time, their energy, all that's being dumped into a kind of project, which I think in some sense um, is historically um, off the table. So I don't know if, if that makes sense to you, Jacob, but that's my, my spontaneous response to your question. Thank well, <laughs> that's oh, good. I, Great. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's it. Paul, do you have a, uh, a follow-up or no? I, question? Not really, because I, I I think you said it very well and very clearly that uh, you know already at the beginning of the 20th century, social democracy revealed that what it was was the organized practice of class collaboration, and you could be for that or against it, depending on your point of view about class society. Uh, but it also requires certain preconditions. You can, the classes can only collaborate when they have a general interest. Right, That's right, the basic right. idea of democracy is that there is a general interest that society shares. And, and we're living at a very interesting moment politically, especially in the United States, but also in Europe, where it's very clear there is no longer a general interest that's constantly being, there's a constant yakking about there's too much disunity and polarization. That's to say there are real now interests, differences of interests are, have become unbridgeable. And Jason explained, I think very well, what the ultimate cause of this is, is that uh, the, the decline in the, the end of that constant increase in the productivity of labor, which created a surplus that could be divided. So a little bit went to the working class while most of it went to that, the, fab the fabled 1%. Uh, but that is no longer being produced. So there is no longer anything to share. So the people who want to revive this 
old idea of social democracy are completely wasting their time. The whole idea that somebody would take seriously for 10 seconds, the idea of Medicare for all, when every country in the world that has Medicare for all, like every European country which has public health care, is destroying it, is taking it apart. Every European country is privatizing their health care system. Europe, uh, England, which had a fantastic national health care system, sold it to American health care corporations. So the idea that suddenly in the middle, well, the entire world is reacting to the decline in profits by getting rid of the welfare state, by eliminating public health care, by getting rid of free public education, that suddenly the United States, the, the world center of greedy <laughs> neoliberalism is going to suddenly have health care for all, free college. Uh, it's so completely insane that the idea that a, a, a rational grown-up person could, could take this seriously for 10 seconds, unless they're getting paid for it, makes no sense at all. Of course, the truth is that the people who are interested in social democracy mostly have found a way to make a living with that interest. There are think tanks and magazines and professorships, and there has nobody is yet willing to say that we really have reached the dog-eat-dog -dog stage now of capitalist development. So there still has to be a certain amount of blather about it must be possible to reconstitute the general interest and everyone should get together and think about a better future for humanity. So all this stuff, somebody has to say that stuff because otherwise you would have to face down the barrel of the climate catastrophe gun and just say, unless we radically change the social order, we're really, really, really fucked. So I think uh, this, is, this is not a historical moment or social democracy, to put it mildly. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> I wish I had your drink. <laughs> I was trying to say to you. Uh, thank you all so much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jacob, for that question. Um, thank you. I yeah, I want to second what was put in the chat. Uh, thank you for this rousing but terrifying <laughs> conversation um, that has given us a lot to think on. Uh, I'm so happy to welcome our poet laureate of this lunchtime, Brendan Joyce. Uh, Brendan Joyce is a busboy and poet from Cleveland, Ohio. His poems have appeared in Johannesburg Review of Books, the Brooklyn Rail and Pandemic Publications, as well as on Twitter. Uh, big ups to that. He is the co-organizer of Grieveland and the author of Character Limit and Love and Solidarity, which I will drop links to in the chat. I'm very fascinated by both these publications. Uh, but everyone give it up for Brendan Joyce. Hey, um, welcome to my bedroom. Uh, and thank you <laughs> to the Brooklyn Rail and the organizers of this uh, conversation and participants for this amazing um, discussion. I'm gonna read a few poems, uh, kind of responding to uh, the topics uh, at hand um, from Love and Solidarity. Uh, can you see that or is it washed out? I think it's pretty much washed out, huh? Um, <laughs> there we go. Yeah, there we go. Um, but yeah, so these are from a uh, long poem, Weekly Claims, and then a long poem, Exit Strategies. Uh, nothing is dead. I have heard more voices than I thought were still living in the tinny tone of my smartphone, bickering and reimagining the context of struggle. I cannot be anything but hope as this empire of ashtrays further incinerates its disappearing handout can I hold you? I used to think a century was long, like I thought a hundred dollars was a lot. I take comfort in how long I've been. Before I would eat off of anybody's plate in the dish pit, starving and hated for such brazenness. I'd wash my hands so many times a shift that the space between my knuckles would turn into little spider webs of dead skin. Hygiene in the restaurant was a stage whisper. Now I wash only my hands in the groceries. Whoever cleans a place knows its ghosts and becomes them. The unemployment office is telling me I didn't earn those unreported tips. I didn't earn those plates I ate off of either. I just took them and hid, hated, and ate. Give a capitalist a beautiful and capacious phrase and they will commit genocide with it. Instead, ask them for seed money for your burgeoning cooperative corner store 
where all the trash cans outside tell you how much the cigarettes will cost, your various invisible interiors. In the grant, we will call this community. Everywhere that isn't the ride is hell. When the earth opens its endless mouth, all I want is pleasure. I left the ice cream on the counter every night. Every morning, a new surprise of spoiled delight. The morning rises and then is quelled. Everywhere that isn't the riot is hell. They keep trying to send us back to work, but they're too late. The light's already changed. You can tell everywhere that isn't the riot is hell. The face of every diner is ring colored. The pageantry of protest strategies echo through the state's appendages. Six laps around the park, soundtracked by unemployment hold music and me waiting for a text from another crush. Anticipation lives everywhere. My history teaches me my neighborhood is just an assortment of porches that have not yet been torched. Love songs to stolen wages with hanging plants attached. We should have burned every restaurant in city limits, but the night sprawled in too many directions. Too much to get through in one sitting, like the skirt steak a patron paid for and insisted I box and then left. Jersey barrier spray painted with the police shield become security to protect the manicured purgatory of restaurant patios. The patio furniture is learning to talk back. Good fences make excellent burglars. The face of every diner is rain colored. 14 houses in a block turn to the soot and one day we'll do the breweries. Body builds itself a mind. The engine of this city is various tourist traps. I traipse around the tourist trap with turbulent rumors and tremors. I have an evil urge to drive west. The height of productivity is death. The face of every diner is a security system. Good fences make excellent burglars. The pageantry of protest strategies echo through the state's appendages. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Give it up for Brendan Joyce, everyone. Hey, hey. I feel like I, I took a lot of notes for, for lines I got to remember. Um, thank you so much for that reading, which I feel like was just perfectly in, in tone. Yeah, for sure. For, for our conversation today. Uh, and thank you for everyone who tuned in, everyone who was here in the comments, asking brilliant questions. Thank you again to Jason and to you, Paul. Uh, please join us again tomorrow when we will be joined by beloved art scene editor, Amanda Glebizzi, for a conversation on our October critics page, which she curated and which features a selection of essays focusing on the edges of paintings. So uh, they sort of explore the edges of paintings as conventions and then as inversions of those conventions and as sites of resistance. She will be joined by Laura Lisbon, Suzanne Silver and Squeak Cornwath, as well as our fabulous managing editor, Charles Schultz. Uh, and that will close with a poetry reading from Steed, Steve Benson. That will be as always at 1 p.m. right here in the Zoom. Uh, other than that, thank you so much for tuning in and you should now be able to turn on your microphones and say goodbye as you leave and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Thank Jason. Thanks Paul. Great conversation, Paul. Paul. Great Thank conversation, you. Jason. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, Brendan. Thank you, Brendan. Thanks for that great Thank reading, you. Brendan. Thank you, Paul. Thanks.